What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Here's today's giveaway, MAPS Resistance. This is a wonderful introduction to resistance training. It's a free program. It's not free, but we're going to give it away to, for free for one of you lucky viewers. Normally, you have to buy it, but one of you is getting hooked up. So it's a great introduction to resistance training. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. You do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to MAPS Resistance. And this is a great program for some of you viewers because today's episode, we're talking to somebody that went through that fitness journey themselves. They're not a fitness expert. They're not a trainer or a coach. They're a regular person, very smart person, but a regular person who went through the journey and talked about her struggles and how she figured things out. So it's a really fun episode. If you're tuning in and you want to get started on resistance training, MAPS Resistance, great program. Again, you can win it for free for doing those things. Also, before we get to the show, uh, we're running a sale right now on two other MAPS workout programs. MAPS Performance is 50% off. That's an athlete-based workout program, so athletic-based, functional exercises, non-conventional exercises. It's a lot of fun. MAPS Aesthetic is also 50% off. That's a bodybuilder-inspired workout program. So it's balance and symmetry and sculpting. That's 50% off. So both half off. If you want MAPS Performance, go to mapsgreen.com. If you want MAPS Aesthetic, go to mapsblack.com. And the discount code for both of them is FEB50. So FEB50 will give you 50% off either one or both of those programs. All right, here comes the show. I met you for the first time. Yeah. The first time I came on your show and um, right away loved you. We got great, great Thanks. energy, great personality. We had a great conversation. I'm very curious. We were just saying this off air, but I'm very curious on your how you got into media. You're much more experienced than yeah. we are, and you can hear it when you hear you on your show. How did you uh, like? How did you first start? You've been doing this 16 years, did yeah. you say? Yeah, a little longer than that. So um, I was a lawyer and a mom. I'm still a mom. I'm still a lawyer. I'm still a <laughs> wife. And uh, and I had an opportunity to be a personal assistant to my father. At the uh, he's still my father, but he <laughs> was going to work for and with Martha Stewart. And so I he needed an assistant, and he needed an assistant because in the early days of the internet. I ended up finding out that somebody who was working for him and helping him was stealing from him via shopping and using credit cards that were not theirs. Oh, wow. So, yeah. I mean, I was like a super sleuth. And back then, you really had to have very little training in being a private eye to be one because you could just call a company and be like, what was my password that I used? And they'd give it to you. Mm -hmm. It was just like really the Wild West. So when I found this out and she couldn't help him anymore, somebody had to. So I just sort of at the dinner table one day was like, I'll go work with you, dad. It was weird. And my kids were little and I'd been home with them and had only done just like a little bit of lawyering legal work for a period of time prior to that. So I started to assist my dad and I met Martha's daughter, Alexis. And this is going back to 2005. And she asked me to do a radio show with her on Sirius XM. So that was how I got into broadcast. And truly, it was on the job training. So I did a show with her for five and a half years. And we did some TV shows. And then after that, I got my own show. And then I did some television. I co-hosted Dr. Drew for a year and just did a bunch of freelance. And that's it. And then I've been doing my Just Jenny show since 2012. Now, what did she tell you yeah. what it was about you that made her want to do that? I mean, that's for someone who yeah. has no experience in that. <laughs> to go, hey, we're going to thrust you yeah. right into serious radio. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a big deal. So what did she see? Yeah, so she didn't she didn't have experience doing it either. And we just had great chemistry when we would talk and we were very different. So the premise of the show back then was sort of we would talk about anything like I do on my current show, but it was from two different um, vantage points. So I was the still am mom and sort of a more traditional lifestyle in a sense. And she was single and living in New York City. So, and she wasn't a mom at the time. So we would just talk about everything and it was great. It was a ton of fun. Wow. And now what, when you, yeah. when you were doing that, was it hard to not go back to what you had gone to school for to be a lawyer? Was that an easy transition? Well, I mean, once you have legal training, you kind of just have that. So mm. I have that in my way of thinking. So that only serves me in whatever I do. Cause I have it. Like I know how to think a certain way. Cause I've been trained to do that, but being an actual lawyer and having clients is not something I really wanted then anyway. So it was all good. What kind of law, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? 
Oh, I was. Uh, so I would go on like I like the drama part of it. I would do per diem work where I'd go to court on behalf of another lawyer who couldn't show up to like have the judge hold off on something. So I did that. I did some mortgage stuff. I did some personal injury where I'd talk to claim representatives from insurance companies. So that kind of thing. Now, what 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 skills th- yeah. that you acquired from being a lawyer have now carried over into what you do today? Well, they carry over into everything in my life. It's a way to argue and to see both sides of of all the issues and find sort of where there may be loopholes or just sort of like holes in people's arguments. What makes an like yeah, that's this is an interesting topic. Yeah. What makes an argument effective? Because I know people. I mean, people yeah. argue all the time, especially yeah. now with social media. What makes something uh, like is the is the obviously the goal is to win the argument by convincing. Either the other person or the the judge or jury. Yeah. Usually, it's the loudest person, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't know that it's to to convince. I think if it's a regular person, if you're having a conversation with someone, the real trick is to get them to sort of see your point of view, but think they came up with that on their own. So it's not it's not necessarily winning. It's all what your objective is or what your goal is. In court, it's a very different thing. It's using the law and whatever is the merits of the case, how they fit into the law, the way in which you want it to turn out. So that's it's like figuring out a puzzle in a sense. But the way to do that the best is to always see both sides, see how the side that you're opposite or opposing, what their argument would be for them to win, and then find how yours can be stronger for you so, to win. So you have do you to be win, able to always see both sides. Do you win all the arguments with your husband then? I don't really win much in my house, so I have um, at all. So I, my, my husband is the great. He's in the insurance business, and he's just the best person. So let me just put that out there. So I don't win arguments with him, but I'm also not very confrontational. So I sort of step back from most arguments. And then we have two big kids. So my 23 year old is in law school and is like a super brainy. I mean, poo poo poo. He's the greatest kid in the world. I love him. I live for him. But he's like super duper smart. So he will say to me, like, yeah, mom, you're a quote unquote lawyer. And I'm like, but dude, you're in law school. Like, I am a lawyer. Like, mm. you can't say quote unquote because I'm actually a lawyer. <laughs> oh, look, there's my husband. Wait, Kitty, come here for I've one second. I've earned that. Yeah. Just come here for one second. So I could just, because I just said you were the greatest person. So come around just for when my husband just walked in. Oh, from that's work. great. Right. Wait. Just come say hi so you can see how cute you are. Yeah. yeah. Tell oh. me, give us a double Look bicep. Look how cute he is. Oh, there he is. Handsome man. And he's a worker outer. I he's can tell. He's, yeah, it looks he's, great shape there, man. Now, is he, would he, yeah. would he, yeah. would he, yeah. he Mr. Shred. Yeah. <laughs> now, is, Shredder. Would he say that you, that he wins yeah. all the arguments too, or is it what he He'd say? He'd say something? he wins most of the arguments. Wow. Though my grandmother used to say that the trick to any. 51 49, my favorite. <laughs> exactly. My grandmother used to say it. that the trick to any successful marriage or relationship is to make him think that he's won. So oh, gosh, so far, so good. But uh, yes, chess. my son likes to he he will he and I argue well together and he's nerdy and we play like grammar games. And then my daughter, who's 21, she's like the coolest person ever. So she like came out of the womb that way. And I don't have a cool bone in my body. So basically, I'm always low person on the totem pole in my house. But it's okay. They love me. <laughs> That's good. So, okay. So you had, you, you, when you and I first met, we talked yeah. a little bit about your yeah. fitness journey, your, yeah. you, know, you had a weight loss journey. And I loved hearing about it because obviously yeah. we're all experts in the field. This is what we do as a profession. And we work with people to try to kind of get them to the place you are. So you're not a personal trainer. No. You're a regular person, you know, for, for lack yeah. of a better term who yes. went through that process and yeah. and kind of figured it out because you've stuck to it now for yeah. so long to the point now where you devote some time on your show yeah. to talk about health and mm-hmm. fitness. How did that start? Let's start there. Like, was this so, w- yeah. was this a, a struggle for you growing okay, up? Yes. And what did this, okay, so what did this look like? Awful. It looked awful. It looked terrible. Um, it looked like a lot of trauma. Uh, my whole life, I, I've battled my weight. And I think that you'll find with most people who – in adulthood have sort of that weight struggle that it started early on. So from the time I was probably eight years old, I was like the rounder one in the group. I wasn't, I wasn't fat, but I was chubby. And back in the, I guess in like 1978, being a chubby eight-year-old stood out for whatever reason. And it terrified my mother. So from the jump, it was sort of clear that there was something about my body that wasn't right, which started that whole kind of weight defining worth thing, which is the most damaging of all. Like 
if there's any message to give any of your clients, which I know that Sal already does, your weight doesn't define anything about you other than your freaking weight. Mm -hmm. Like we give it so much power and so much importance. And so from that age, I was going back and forth. I was checked for diabetes and I wasn't like, I go back and I look at the pictures and I was like a kid who maybe had 10 extra pounds. I wasn't, but I was short. So my mother was scared and she had her own sort of food and body issues, which again, super common. And um, throughout my life, I was like a little bit fat, like moderately heavy. And I use the word fat because I just don't care. Like at f- turning 52, like that was the vocabulary we used. We didn't have sort of heavy and plus size and extra. But um, I just, it was always this thing throughout my childhood and my teenage years that my weight would go up, my weight would go down, my weight would go up, my weight would go down. And then after I had children, um, and even when I met my husband, I was probably 30 pounds heavier than I am now, which was like the most healing thing in the world because he just loved me. He didn't like he thought I was hot and sexy and that whole padunk dunk thing. And I <laughs> for me, that was so strange because I was always so insecure. But um, but not he that was incredibly healing because he really He loved the whole thing, which a lot of men, that's a thing. They like a woman that has curves and stuff. And so, uh, but after I had kids, my weight, I just, there was stresses in life and I think hormones and I think my anxiety, it just got out of control. And then I started to kind of rein it in on my own, doing a little bit of Weight Watchers and, and changing my food habits. And then my mother got sick and my mom had pancreatic cancer. And she passed away in 2008. She was 65 and I was 38. And when she died, I think there was something in me that kind of clicked or flipped or something. I all of a sudden was staring my mortality in in, really in the face because I had never, you know, like you worry about stuff happening. But then when the actual thing happens, it's like a it's a you're sucker punched. And uh, and it was a wake up call, I think, on every level, like I all of a sudden was like, oh, wait, I only have one life and that could end really at any time. And if I don't do the things that I want to do in this life, then what, why am I here? And if I don't make the effort to choose my health over sort of everything else, then again, that's not great. And I realized that I had to love myself enough to want to to be well. And so I I and I'm sure also a part of it because though my mother was my best friend and we lived next door to each other and were forever really really close. I don't know if any of you are Jewish, but a New York Jewish home, there's a lot of uh there's a lot of enmeshment and we were super attached. So I'm sure that part of my weight struggle and sort of her difficulty with my body size made it harder for me to lose weight while she was alive because it was sort of like to make her happy in that way, I'm sure was a complicating on some subconscious level. That was a tough thing. So I, I remember going to my, of course I had and still do had a lot of doctors. And I went to this cardiologist because I was always afraid I was going to drop dead because I was overweight and I was 38. And he said, not going to let you die of heart disease. And um, and then we had this discussion about cancer and fat, actual fat, what fat, how fat can contribute to cancer and cancer diagnosis and certainly the digestive cancers. So I think at that moment, I just sort of knew that something had to give. And it was the first time in my life that I approached weight loss, not from a perspective of, oh, I'm going to wear a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, or I'm going to look a certain way. It was like, I'm just going to not be clinically obese. Like if I could just get out of that like clinical obese categorization, I'm good enough. And I'd never thought like that before. It was either I'm going to look like someone on TV or I'm not even trying. But changing my mindset starting then changed everything. And I'd go to a nutritionist to be weighed backwards once a month to make sure that I was losing weight and it was going in the right direction. I couldn't look at the scale until I was not classified as clinically obese. And then once I could get to that point, then I took ownership and could weigh myself. And my God, I still don't understand how I was able to lose as much as I was able to lose. And I still don't understand in a way, like it still feels like a miracle that it's 11 years later and I still wear the same size jeans. But 
I see that knowing that it's by design. Like I work really hard at it. It's just become very much my life that I just do the things I do in order to keep myself as I am. Yeah. Well, n no secret uh, yeah. as to why it was successful. It was the the approach that you had. The mm -hmm. uh, you know I, This is something I want to do for my health. And you didn't mm -hmm. look at the scale. By the way, this is a, a very yeah. effective tool. I did, I've done this with clients many, many times where, depending on the individual, sure. uh, I'll say, let's take your scale, put it in the closet. I don't want you to weigh yourself for the next two months. And yeah. I just want you to focus on your strength and your performance and how you feel. And yeah. then at the end of two months, we can look at things and see where you're at. And of course, if they do that, uh, like, like it's like magic. They, oh my God, I can't believe I lost, you know, seven, yeah. eight pounds or 10 pounds of body fat. And I'm like, well, yeah, it, it, it makes a, a huge difference. Going back to when you were, I have children, so this is a very, yeah. uh, this is, uh, when you talked about being a kid and getting yeah. that message at eight years old, Ugh. was it like a, like, was it a blatant out the, you know, like, hey, oh, yeah. you're, you're, okay. it was terrible. Okay. So it was sort of, but also in all fairness, as a mom, like I, once my mother died and I could have some space from all of it, um, I, I actually just posted, it's funny because I posted a reel on Instagram of, of, I, I do this, what I eat in a day, reel. All the time on Instagram and on TikTok, I make these videos of what I eat every day. And I did one every year on my mother's birthday. I celebrate her birthday by eating cake because that's what she would have done. And um, and so it's just so funny to have the space from all of it because it was like that was such a small part ultimately of our whole relationship and certainly of our adult relationship. But from the time I was like eight years old till probably the time I got married, it was a big deal because she was so terrified because of the world that how would the world treat me yeah. heavy? How would the world treat? How would I meet someone? This was all her thinking. And so, of course, she sort of gave that to me, but it was her own insecurities with her body. Even though she was skinny, she had her own eating issues. And um, but yeah, she was pretty direct. I mean, it certainly felt like my weight determined how much she was going to be happy with me with whatever it was. And I had a sister who was still have a sister and I love her, but she, she was always super skinny as a small child. So we had different body types and she's older than me. So I think it was just a different, you know, I think, and also I think I was a lot, I think I was a lot to, to handle. I had, I always had a big mouth and uh, so a lot of energy. And, <laughs> yeah. And a lot of energy. And I'm the youngest of three. I have a big brother too. So Yeah. But it was pretty direct. Yes, no. people. And also she would offer like my sister was giving cookies and I was like giving a salad. I mean, the whole thing was a disaster. Now, Jenny, you've been consistent for the last 11 years now. Yeah. Did you, when you made that mental switch and then yeah. down this path, has everything been the right decision or did you make some mistakes in these 11 oh, wow. years? Have you, have you learned new things about exercise and nutrition? And what were some of the mistakes that you, you made during that time? Well, I think, and I know, Sal, you've talked about it too. You've had different times that you've had to re, though that was Justin or Adam who just asked. That was Adam. Adam. All right. Uh, that you've had different times or you've had to, I only know Sal's story. I know more than the two of you. Nothing personal. I yeah. just <laughs> talked to him on the show. We've got to spend some but, time together. <laughs> exactly. But um, I, yeah, of course. I mean, I think every person who does go through a weight loss journey or a body transformation. It's just the worst language. But anyone who, who does that, yeah, there's a lot of mistakes. So I've had, I've, I think one of the mistakes that I've had is always trying at, up until the past couple of years, trying to sort of fit into a mold of what is the proper food identity or way to eat. Like mm. I'd watch other people and think that I wasn't doing it right because I eat the way I eat and I don't count this or I only count that. Or even exercise was for many, many, many years for me punishment. And so I did it. When I first had lost a lot of weight, I worked out a ton and I worked out in the way that people told me to work out. I had trainers. And every time I had trainers, nothing personal, I would just want to tell them and I can curse on your show. You yes, can. Of course. Uh, yes, please. So I would be like, I'm paying you, but also fuck off. Yeah. And like, what? It doesn't even make sense because I hired somebody to weight train me. And then I tell them literally to go fuck themselves because the psychology of being told what to do just really didn't work for me. And it took a long time for me to trust that. To, to know that I had to I had to find it within me to train and to want to learn and to want to do the things on my timeline, how I need to do it. So that was definitely a mistake, sort of putting my power into somebody else. Um, also, just, just an inability to, again, sort of 
to quiet the noise around me of, of people or people I'd see places um, telling me what I should or should not do. It also took me a very long time to realize that the scale is just data. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a mistake, kind of putting my worth in that number. And there were times early on where I was decimated. The scale would go up three pounds and I'd take to the bed and I'd be like, oh, I'm just, this is all over for me. And like three pounds isn't 80 pounds, but in my head at the time, I couldn't, like, I couldn't understand how it all worked. Whereas now I laugh. I mean, I'm going to be 52 years old. The scale is so wacky. It could be <laughs> three pounds up tomorrow and then four pounds down the next day. Like there's no rhyme or reason tied to sort of what I've eaten exactly at this age because I'm a woman. And so I've had to really change how I think about that too. And I have changed that. And then the exercise, as I was saying, was so much punishment because again, like my family, we would, we would be going on a family vacation where there would be vacation from school. And like my brother and my sister and my dad would be essentially going to Disney and my mom would be taking me to a spa. And I was like 10. And so no kid really wants to go to the spa at 10, that like diet place that they're going <laughs> to put you on mountains to walk up hills. Like, no. So it took a long time for me to look at exercise as a gift and a joy to be able to move my body rather than uh, extreme punishment. I mean, walking was just, I was like, what? I have to do that. And now I love it so much. Like I love to exercise, which is so weird to even say. Yeah, that's great. Well, speaking of your family too, yeah. um, um, now knowing how it affected you, uh, the conversation yeah. around weight and everything yeah. growing up, like how, what are those conversations like with your kids? Yeah. Well, do you, all three of you have children? We yeah. do. Yeah. Isn't it the most terrifying thing? <laughs> <laughs> nothing is, nothing They're is little scarier. mirrors, right? Yeah. There's nothing mm -hmm. scarier. And when you're talking about your mom and her challenges, yeah. it's like, I just yeah. think to myself, like, oh yeah, like we're, we're so, we're imperfect. And then we're raising yeah. other humans. And, yeah. And it's like, man, I, you just do the best you can. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I think the goal is that you will mess them up in different ways. Your parents messed you up because you're gonna screw them up. I mean, they're gonna have issues with you. You just want them to be different from the ones that you have. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a that's a tough thing okay. to accept. <laughs> but it's true, and yeah. when you realize that, and and then and then the other kind of parenting thing that my husband and I both from the start agreed on upon is that the things that matter the most with our children is that they're breathing. That's first and foremost, and that they find the thing that makes them tick. And it's going to be different, probably, from what makes us happy. But if they're like decent enough humans, and they find what makes them happy or tick or be okay, then that's that's good enough. The rest of it will fall into place. We try to parent with it, very little judgment. And certainly we do the good cop, bad cop stuff. Like he's the good cop and I'm the, the horrible mother. Yeah. But you've sort of modeled this uh, for mm -hmm. them. Have they been paying attention to your weight loss journey and everything? Oh and yeah. Okay. So it? the best. Are, so we laugh because when my daughter was three, uh, all I prayed, all I prayed was that I would not give my children my issues. I did not want their worth defined by their weight, especially my daughter. I was really like, you know, I was always modest and my body, I was ashamed of every bit of my body. And, uh, and but not around my family or my husband or my kids. And you know, from early on when I was first with my husband, we would have sex and I would like try to scamper into the closet to put my clothing back on. <laughs> and and he literally walked over to the closet, opened the door, and was like, You need to get out of the closet. Like, obviously, I love you and your body because this is this is all going on because I love you and your body. Like, this is absurd. And from then on, I was like, you know, then I was always naked, which is all weird too, but okay. Uh <laughs> I was young at one point, but with my daughter, we always had this, this kind of, I mean, even to this day, I'll be showering and she's 21 years old and she'll walk into the shower with me. Like she, we have zero boundaries in this house. And so, and, and that was good because she saw, even though I was overweight and even though I was not super secure, it didn't translate to her being insecure. Like she, she loves herself. Like I, I have to like, I'll be like, put that away. Like I'm like, put, can you please put some clothing? I can't enough. Um, she's so cute, but she used to look at me and I remember at three years old. Um, and when I was, oh boy, I was, my heaviest was probably 2004. Like my son had had a health scare and I just did not leave my house for six months. And I, oh, it was awful, but he was fine, thankfully. And, uh, but she, she would say to me, mommy, I want to grow up and be just like you. And I want to have a butt just like yours. Wow, that's great. 
And uh, (laughs) nobody wanted that ass. Nobody (laughs) wanted that ass. And um, yeah, no. So she's thankfully has grown up with a really healthy self-esteem when it comes to her body. And look, she's a 21-year-old girl. So she's aware of society and she is certainly not like a teeny, you know, she's tall. She's well, tall by my, I'm five, two. So she's like five, six. And, um, and she looks a lot like my husband and she's adorable and she just is comfortable in her skin. So she's not, she's not skinny and she's not fat. She's strong and she's beautiful. And, um, her body isn't her issue. It's only her issue as much as it's any other girl's issue. Like a normal, if she gains five pounds, she loses five pounds. She doesn't, doesn't define her. Yeah. It's just like whatever. You know, it's, it's really, so I have two, I have three kids, right. And two, two of them are older and I have a daughter now that's 12. Yeah. And I did not real, I remember taking my daughter to ballet class and Mm. she was, I want to say nine. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I realized my daughter was really aware of how she looked. Yeah. While they, they, when they were sitting there, supposed to listen to the instructor, I could see her looking in the mirror mm. and kind of fixing her hair. And yeah. then she was kind of like trying to suck in her tummy. And I was oh. wow, devastated. Oh. Well, and it's look, this is part of growing up. You become aware of how you look and how, and yeah. but this happens much earlier for girls, I think. And I was just, I remember thinking like my little girl is now entering into a shitty this is she's learning that there's a shitty part that she has to deal with, yeah. and it broke my heart. It was so difficult, but this is just it's a it's a part of things, and we have to navigate. We have to learn how to navigate it now, probably better than ever, especially with the, you know social media and and all that stuff. Really, really. How tough. is your How is your relationship with her? Really, I mean, my daughter. She knows she's my princess. I love her. To She'll death. be fine. Yeah, that's, that's one of the most important things in terms of how women ultimately grow up and choose a partner if they're straight. I mean, yeah. so from what I know. And so if you have a strong bond with her and she feels like in your eyes, she's the most beautiful and the smartest and the coolest and the greatest and the funniest and all those things, she'll be fine. Oh, well, you know what I do, Jenny? I, I, I yeah. purposely try to set the standard really ridiculous. So we, every year there's this father daughter dance that we go to. Yeah. Yeah. And I make it such a big deal. Like I show mm. up, I, dr- I wear a suit, I kneel, Aww. and I give her a corsage, and Aww. I take out her chair, and I, and so I'm like, sweet. yeah, and I'm like, I'm gonna ruin it for the douchebags that try to date her because they're, they're, ne- they're never yeah. gonna be able to live up to these standards. That's yeah, literally the no, goal. that's like my husband and my daughter have watched Grey's Anatomy since the show started. <laughs> that is their thing. Oh, and they say they have girl time every weekend and <laughs> you know, before she went to college. And it's so cute. And they're best friends. And it's really been it's she, um, you know, she has lovely relationships and it's all good. That's so what, your daughter will be fine. Thank you. You know, I want to ask you this because yeah. it, you, growing up, you just you mentioned about the spa as a kid. You hated yeah. it, obviously. And you weren't a, a gym fanatic up until oh God, no. later on. Did you have a perception of the gym before you started working out? And then did it change at all as you started to become yeah. consi- more consistent or maybe change your own relationship with exercise? Like, were there yeah. preconceived notions that may- maybe were either off or were they justified? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, for sure. I think that gyms now today, it's a much better world for the most part for someone who just likes to exercise because they like to exercise. You can find your right place to work out. But again, back then, I mean, it was just like like every other aspect of the weight stuff. I always felt less than when I would see somebody who was kind of jacked at the gym and look at them and be like, but that's never going to be me because I didn't I didn't understand really that like that was their job. I mean, like if you're a female and you're a trainer and this is what you do every day, then of course you're totally. going to be in that kind of shape and you're doing all the things you have to do to get there. For me, I think the the shift to understand that exercise is for my mental health and well-being. It's great for my heart to move a lot. And, and that was something that was important to me. I think that really helped me a lot. I don't see exercise as sort of the um, antidote to overeating or a way to fix if I've I don't know, had a big dinner or whatever. Like it's not going to make you lose weight. It just doesn't. And and I also think I for a while, I remember someone saying to me, like, you can, I'm going to train you. And this is when I was probably 50, 60, 70 pounds overweight. Someone was like, Oh, you could start to train with me, but like you might gain weight at first. 
And I was like, I, I, if I have 70 pounds, it's like, I can't afford to gain any weight. Like, that's not the way to approach this. I already hate exercise. Now you're telling me it's going to make me heavier. How about no? So again, like finding and really learning by experience, like, yes, the scale can go up sometimes from exercise. If I overdo it, the scale does go up. Like there are days that I do so much cardio and I know that's ridiculous. And I know that people are like, don't do so much, but I like it for my head. I love how it makes me feel. So I do it for that. But if I do that, and then I also like lift a few weights or do some high intensity um, interval training or whatever, the scale will go up two pounds. Like I have that full on inflammatory response. And then, but because I know it, I can laugh at it. Like I've learned how my body works. So yeah, I mean, it's totally changed how I, how I see exercise. Also as I age, I I was saying when I was talking to Sal earlier, like I want to have mobility. And if you don't move your body, you're not going to be able to move to do things like pee. Like I need to be able to sit (laughs) on the toilet and then also get up from the toilet. Like I need to be able to do all the, reach for things in my kitchen or have balance when I get on a step ladder. Like you need to be able to do things. And if you don't move, you're not going to be able to do things. Now, Jenny, one, one of the hardest things for people yeah. is, is to, because uh, we don't have a, a weight loss pro- problem in this country. People will lose weight every year. It's they yeah. don't keep it off. Right. And they, they don't. And so have you been able to distill down to a handful of things or, you know, mm-hmm. values yes. or yes. habits that you're like, these are my, okay, tell me what those are for you. Yeah. Well, so this is the, and I'm sure because of your podcast, you guys know there's this big movement for people to say, don't worry about what you eat and how much you eat and don't worry about your body and it's all okay. Right. Great. It is all okay. But if you're somebody who has lost a lot of weight, the only way to keep it off is to be aware of what you're eating pretty much always and to have some element of movement in your life, uh, significant exercise. So you got to work out an hour a day. You just have to. I don't really get days off. And again, because I changed how I think about exercise, I love it. It's a gift. I'm so, I'm in my happy place when I'm in my gym. Um, but, and I also, I pay attention to my food. I just do. I mean, it doesn't mean that I don't eat cake or eat pizza or eat junk or whatever sometimes. Of course I do. But I always know when I'm doing it. I don't ever get to just go ham somewhere because it just doesn't, I can't. And I know that because if you've been heavy, you can always be heavy again, unless you are on a consistent basis doing the things that keep you not heavy. Now, having said all that, it's not a motivation. It's really habit. And I know you guys look at it as discipline. I really see it as habit. I don't think I have presence of mind enough to be disciplined but I do have habits. And so like I brush my teeth every day. I get on the scale every day. I go on my treadmill every day, do my radio show. You know, it's like I do the things that I do and that just taking care of myself that falls into it. Yeah. It, it, uh, habit, discipline. I think when some mm-hmm. people think discipline, they think like, oh, well, the, I'm going to tough yeah. through this. Well, no, the discipline yeah. is what led to the habit. Yeah, you had a, to have discipline sure. to be consistent with that. It became a habit yeah. and now the sure. habit is what's really important. You know, I want to I comment yeah. on something that you, cause there, you have. A, there's a lot of insight that you've, figured out for yourself that I don't yeah. I don't know if you realize how brilliant it is and I'll explain what I mean. So you talked about being aware of what you're mm-hmm. eating. Now, you know, 50,000 years ago, this wasn't a problem. You had food, you right. ate it, and food was hard to come by. We now live in a situation where food is so accessible, yeah. so plentiful, so inexpensive. I mean, I can have yeah. any flavor of anything I want within 10 minutes, especially if you live in a in a city. Yeah, in a city. So you, the awareness part is extremely important. And it's funny because they do studies on this and they find, for example, if people eat while watching TV or eat while on their phone, they'll eat like 10 to 15% more calories. And it's sure. literally the lack of awareness that is causing that. There's also studies that show that if people put their fork down in between mm-hmm. each bite, they tend to uh, eat less. All yeah. it's doing is it's bringing more awareness to what's happening and to, to simplify it, it's more complex yeah. than this, it's literally that lack of awareness. It means that those satiety signals are going to take longer to hit. It means that yeah. you're going to potentially go past the point of satiety, which, you know, five, 10% more calories than you normally would eat. Well, you add that up throughout Over the week. Time. And oh, that, yeah. yeah, that's, that's, that's pounds and pounds and pounds uh, of, you know, of body fat every single year. Yeah. So awareness is extremely important when you're eating. And most people don't realize that they're, their awareness starts and stops with what sounds good. You know, what do you want for lunch? Uh, Mexican. I don't know. That doesn't kind of, maybe that sounds good. What about Chinese? Yeah, let's do that. So the awareness is really just about that. 
but around nothing else. And, uh, you know, yeah. so w- what you're saying is, uh, and I love talking to people like you because you figured this out through st- staying through that process, right? Uh, yeah. What about this? Did you, did you have a, because you talked about weight on the scale. And one of sure. the things that I noticed with clients, probably I'd say more true for women than men. Yeah. They're afraid of the weight gain until they start to have a different relationship with muscle because muscle is denser than body fat. Sure. So five pounds of muscle takes up about one third less space, less space yeah, than body fat. Sure. And so sure. I, I used to do this thing, Jenny, where I had this trainer that worked for me, this female trainer. She was very fit or whatever. And whenever I'd have a potential member come in that wanted to lose weight and I talked to them about lifting weights and cardio and all that stuff. And they say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to gain any weight. I don't want to build any muscle. I'd say, I tell you what, I'm going to have one of my trainers come in, and if you can guess her body weight within 10 pounds, I'll give you a free six month membership. And they say, Oh, I let's love do that. that. She would come in, she was tiny, mm-hmm. she was like five foot one, and they'd be like, Oh, she weighs 90 pounds. And she'd get on the mm-hmm. scale and she was like 130 pounds or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I'd say, Yeah, she looks like she's tiny because she's muscle and she's lean. She's and compact. Take, yeah. Yes, and she takes up less space and she's got the curve and the of course the faster metabolism that goes along yeah. with it. Did you start to change your relationship with like muscle and strength? I know a lot of people start weight yeah. loss. And like, I just want to get the weight off. I don't care. I just want to get smaller. Yeah. And then as they stick to it, it's like, well, you know, I want to feel strong. I, I don't mind some of this muscle curve. Did that happen to you through the process? I think what I learned, like my whole life, I've always weighed 10 pounds more than I looked because I have one of those dense bodies. Like I was built that way with strong leg muscles and and you know, very narrow on top, but really strong and just strong, that type of physique. So I was never going to weigh the super low numbers that other people who look like me might weigh, right? Like you put someone who looks like me and she'll probably weigh 10 pounds less than I do. So I already have had like an understanding that my weight was never going to be one of those crazy low numbers. And, and really I became okay with that once I put health as the, as the priority. So I really go by blood work first, because I'm a big believer and you go to your freaking doctor and take your blood and look at your blood sugar and look at your cholesterol levels and look at all like the inflammation markers. And you'll know if your weight is in an okay spot, because at least for me, my body is very weight sensitive. Some people's aren't and God bless them. But if I am overweight, my numbers are not good. And so I'm one of those people that can't be overweight because they talk about health at every size. And I do believe there are people that can be really significantly overweight and they're great. They don't have any metabolic syndrome. They have none of that, but I will like all of heart disease. I can't afford to have, I have to need, I have to be alive. So first and foremost, I shifted my priorities and perspective to being about the other metrics as sort of the defining factors in my health. And then in terms of the muscle versus fat, well, yeah, I mean, I want to be strong. So I don't like, I know that there's muscle in there. Um, and, and I, I'm never going to build like, I'm never going to build like a bodybuilder because I'm, I'm not built like that either, but I do have the kind of body that when I weight train, I do build some muscle and it doesn't, yeah, the scale doesn't scare me like it did on in that way. Not at all. That's because awesome. I just know, I just know what it is at this point. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, you said earlier about, um, exercising to, to, to kind of like, you know, yeah. take care of yourself. And yeah. whereas before you would exercise, it's kind of like a punishment. Can you Always. go in, can you talk about that a little We talk about that yeah. all the time on the show, yeah. but I'd love to hear from someone who went through that shift of, oh, this is me punishing myself, beating myself mm-hmm. up to, I'm taking care of myself right now. Like, what, what was that like? So, um, I struggle with anxiety. <laughs> does everybody? Do you guys mm. have anxiety issues? You know, you know what? Uh, you're a very, Sal definitely does. Yeah, you know, you're a very smart person, and uh, yeah. thinkers, people tend to be in their head a lot, tend to yeah. overthink things, and there's a higher rate of uh, of anxiety among them. So, it doesn't shock me that someone like you uh, would would struggle with that a little bit. I think there was a compliment in there, so yeah, thank yes. you. Uh, <laughs> also, I complimented myself. Adam doesn't yeah, realize right, that. Right, I got that. Oh, I no, I realize that. that. <laughs> oh, we got that. Adam's <laughs> super calm. Yeah. Never, never, uh-huh. never anxious. Adam's very mellow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I smoke a lot of weed. doesn't so worry that's about thing. a thing yeah, ever. It helps. Uh, just doesn't cross his mind. So, yeah, so I, I've always had anxiety. And, uh, and so uh, about, I guess, the, right before the pandemic, around... November, early December before. So December of 2019, I wasn't, I hadn't really been exercising regularly or exercising enough. And I think I felt it. Like, I think I felt not as 
well walking upstairs. And my weight was around the same. Maybe I was five pounds heavier. I mean, really nothing. And um, and but exercise was still at this point where it was a it was punishment. It was a way to maintain my weight, and it was it was drudgery. I was just miserable. Like I didn't want to deal. And I was about to go on a family vacation, and with my extended family, and uh, and I had kept reading over and over again that exercise was a great stress reliever, and exercise is a great way to improve your mental health and to help when you feel down or depressed. And also, I was turning was I in twenty nineteen? I was turning fifty. I turned fifty in twenty twenty. So. I was like 49 and I, so my hormones are in every, you know, I am not menopausal yet people, but I knew it was coming. It was on the horizon, still on the horizon. I, okay. And so have we lost everyone who watches your podcast yet? <laughs> I said menopause. <laughs> no, no, no. So, um, we just paused. So right I kept reading this, like how you get relief from feeling awful is to move. And I was like, huh? So you're saying, I would say to what I was reading that if I just move my body for 30 minutes a day, any which way, that that will decrease my stress level and make it more a- make me more able to deal with whatever's thrown at me. Okay, I'm going to try this. And I gave myself zero rules, like zero heart rate importance, zero sort of intensity importance, didn't matter what I was doing. I was like, you are just going to move Beautiful. your body for a half hour every day and see what happens. So I start doing this in December. I do it all through my vacation. I went through that vacation and actually had fun. I all of a sudden, like, and when I say all of a sudden, it really probably took 60 days. Like that whole 30 days to create a habit is a lie. I think it probably took 60, but it shifted in January when I was already starting to sort of feel a mental improvement and like moving my body, which was crazy. um, I added the goal of 10,000 steps a day. That changed everything. Because again, that's my only rule. Now, do I do more things? Yes. Do I find a way to like do arm weights twice a week? Yes. Do I sometimes work out really hard, like on my Peloton or whatever it is that I do? Sure. The only rule I have is that every single day I get 10,000 steps. And since January of 2020, I have not, I've missed one day. And and that was because, and here we're going to lose more viewers again and listeners. um, It was the day of like a colonoscopy, an endoscopy. (laughs) And I just, the day I was like out and whatever. You get a a pass. Yeah, you get a pass. I got it. But that's it. That's the only day I've missed. Yeah, you know it's funny when whenever I years. whenever I talk to anybody who's been exercising for a long time, they yeah. they start touting the mental health uh, benefits of exercise way over the physical. You know what I love about yes. this conversation, Jenny? It's literally like most of what you're saying yeah. is what we per, what we tend to tell people and prescribe. Like the 10,000 steps the value in that isn't that's 10,000 steps. It's no. that you spread them throughout the day. You're more aware of, of your activity and your movement. Yeah. And, you know, there's many, what do they say? There's many paths up the mountain. At some, but at some point, if everybody's, this is what I love about fitness. If yeah. you stick to it and you're consistent mm-hmm. and you do it for the right reasons, you'll learn the right ways to do it. You start to figure that out. And like, yes. I, didn't, I didn't train you. You weren't following Mind Pump this whole time. You weren't listening to what we were talking about. But you're talking about a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the show. This is so great. I love hearing. All yeah, of but stuff. I said to you, you have a very, you guys have a very good philosophy with training. I don't think any of you think that somebody should walk into a gym and just go hard. No. no. Because it doesn't, like, that wrecks the whole process. You have to, like, little by little, create that language within your body to be able to do the things for the time and day that you can go hard. And then the next day, you don't go as hard. Like, there has to be that sort of flexibility and understanding that it's all good. And the 10,000 steps, I mean, that number, you know, comes from just a guy who liked the sound of that number. Yep. Well, a lot of this, a lot of it too, and you touched on this earlier briefly, and and we come from this point, is the psychology of it, right? I mean, yeah, going in and working harder in the gym for your first day may burn more calories, may, Mm -hmm. may make you lose weight a little faster, but it's a terrible way to start somebody who was doing no exercise whatsoever. Oh, yeah. It just yeah. it, it causes that extreme one way than the other way. And we know that from years of experience. And so yeah. that's why it's such a bad message that a lot and that our industry perpetuates. I mean, it's yeah. very popular that, you know, the all the fitness influencers are, you know, touting the beast mode and the all out and the yeah. crush it and kill it. Like those are all sayings that you hear all the time. And yeah. it's one of the biggest problems with I think people being 
consistent is they're they're given the the wrong advice on how they should yeah, start. Yeah, to figure out those repeatable actions that you can keep up and maintain, so it becomes a lifestyle. So we got to figure those things out first. Yeah, you have to totally. like it. You have to like it, even uh, the discomfort. You have to like it. A hundred percent. It's like it's it, it's not as sexy either. Like you could watch The Biggest Loser and watch them go through that crazy drama and they cry and they beat the crap out of them, whatever. As trainers. Yeah. It's, it's like watch. It's like listening to to nails on a chalkboard the entire time. Like this is so wrong. You are teaching people. I, I can only imagine. Like you're a lawyer. I'm trying to think of like a lawyer, like a yeah, law show, probably like TV yeah. show. Yeah. yeah, you're probably watching. Like that's not how it goes. Works. This Judge. No Listen, way. I well, no, I mean, yeah, actually, I some of the procedurals I happen to really like. But yes, they're all that. None of that's it's television. But the Biggest Loser, I actually like. I found it when I was heavy. God, I was like, can I just go on this show? If they didn't, if they didn't make people wear the jog bras and the <laughs> the bike shorts, I think I would have put myself in the running to be on the show. Oh. But I just couldn't have dealt with that. There was just no, uh, uh-uh. yeah. and I now, you know, years later, Bob Harper's a friend of mine. I really like him a lot. He's changed his whole philosophy yeah. about um, exercise and wellness. And yeah, there are some nice people that come out that came out of of that show. Listen, great people, nice people. It really yeah. does glamorize the wrong. Appro- I'm so glad you I didn't do it. I know you're joking, yeah. but yeah. I, I'm telling you right now. Had you gone on that show and done that? Well, I think the intent of that show originally was actually really good and pure. I yes. really do. But what happens, and I'm sure you know better than any of us, yeah. you know, they have to rate, dramatize it. Well, ratings, right? And you start to go, oh, the wow, when we had somebody do this, yeah. we got more views. So let's let's start to encourage. So what ends up happening, something very good and pure and with good yeah. intentions starts, and then it kind of molds into yeah. this monster. Producers get involved. Yeah. Yeah. You know what and it then they me? learned a lot. They learned a lot about metabolism and why people gain back weight and what is the real truth about exercise and you know it's it is so complicated you you know this right that it, that it is and body stuff is complicated it is but we make it so much more complicated and you know what it reminds me of uh remember the original season of the real world i just That's watched the this. best ever are yeah. you kidding me it is oh, i just watched the a reunion and they got along for the most part on the show and everybody's I great i know heather b i work with heather b. no oh, way yeah. okay oh, no yeah way. they She's eventually great. the producers figured out man if we put people together who want to go at each other's throats we're gonna get more ratings and it turned into a shit show but the original one was really beautiful yeah. oh. yes yeah. Yes, yes it was so great yeah. okay so one one last question jenny because yes. I, I i love again your story is so great and you're this you're a great person to communicate this Thank do you, you if there's if there's somebody listening right now uh yeah. they're overweight they're they've, yep. something they've struggled with since they were a kid yeah and they have those body image issues which most yeah. of us most of us have even even yeah. especially uh, many people in the fitness space what's the one piece of advice you could give them that you think will help uh that they have to keep trying if it's what they want to do so first and foremost, anybody with a weight struggle has to determine if they want to lose weight, has have to determine, oy, has to determine if they want to, in fact, lose weight. It's up to them. They don't have to listen to anybody around them. They have to make that decision. And if, in fact, they do want to change their bodies or their body, they have to then find their specific way, which isn't going to look like anybody else's. For some people, going on Weight Watchers or doing Atkins or doing the Zone or the Mediterranean diet or freaking Octavia, I don't even know what, like whatever it is that's going to work for you is different from what works for somebody else. It, we're not all physically the same. I would also say, always check in with a medical provider because maybe there is, we used to joke back in the 80s and 90s about metabolic issues, but some people have them. And there are now medical doctors who are trained in the disease of obesity to really help these people. And so you can seek out support. There's a whole field of medicine in addition to doing, there's no magic, never going to be magic, but there are ways to get it done. You don't have to live in a body that makes you feel uh, not well. That's just what I believe, but it never ends. It's not a process that like you're going to lose weight and then yay, I'm done. There is no done. So like your philosophy has to change about it, which I think is the other shift that happened for me. Just this understanding that it's lifelong, that if you have, if you struggle with your weight, it's lifelong and that's okay. We all have some struggles, but there's no, there's no end point. So, but you have to ultimately, like you've said before, love the process of it because we get one life. So find a way to like enjoy what you're doing in it. 
Be- beautifully love, put, love it's it. a it's a journey with no destination. Thank you so right. much for coming on Thank the show. You. Jenny. Yeah, you're you're, yeah. you're you're wonderful. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much it for was coming. Great on meeting and, you, Jenny. I'm gonna yeah. mention nice to one you. more thing though. I yes. want I want your if any of your listeners and viewers are over 40, they have to go to bunnyeyes.com, which is my glasses. I invented glasses that can you can tilt the front of the frame like that. And oh, you can cool. also oh. so you can watch TV and read your phone at the same time, but you can also like drop the temple so like if you're lying in your bed your temple doesn't dig into the side of your head oh wow when you're watching yeah when you're um, reading or watching tv on your side and then well you could drop both temples and then when you're getting your hair done you well can since you like went opera glasses when you went since you went yeah. that way i do want to ask i heard you got into yeah. the blue blocking space is that correct of course yeah, now, yeah, yeah. we okay. make blue blockers of course, so blue tell blockers. me did you did you have a personal what led you that way this is something by the way as, yeah. a, as a uh, teenage kid, I remember when they were popular back when my uh, the commercials of the driving at night. And, yeah, and yeah. Were, it was kind of a Super joke, orange. right? We made fun of anybody that were here. I am I now in my 40s now and I wear them yeah. every single day. And so but you don't need readers yet. You don't need like I don't. One or yeah, point. I'm How lucky. Po- and you're over 40. Yeah, I know. He just doesn't read. Yeah, that's, <laughs> he doesn't. that's right. Remember, he's yeah. the one that doesn't yeah. worry. Yeah. And he yeah. doesn't yeah. read. Yeah. Makes perfect that's sense. why. Just you know? pictures. Don't don't read. Don't read anything. Don't watch TV. You won't have any anxiety. Perfect. It's <laughs> so, so good. Yeah, we started making blue light blockers because there was a need for it because people want them. So that yeah. was why we added them to our our line. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. They're cool. Excellent. Uh, yeah, we, we talk about blue light blocking glasses all the time and their value. So and we use yeah, them all good. all the time. Yeah, they make a big difference. Again, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you. Good to have you.